we have um, our really great guests here today on the Jones Act, and I'm going to I'm going to actually let them all introduce themselves. And so because we've got a really extraordinary group of people here. So um, who am I going to start with? I think I will start with Colin Grabo. Um, where are you coming to us from? And uh, are you in Washington right now? Where, where are you? I am in Washington. So that, that's where I, so it's, uh, it's nine o'clock at night over here. All right. Thank you so much. And it's been a, a pretty busy year there. I mean, day there. I've been sitting there watching them, looking for the Speaker of the House and paying all kinds of attention with that. Can you explain to the listener, many people um, driving down the road might not be as familiar with the Jones Act as one would think, being as how important it is with shipping in Hawaii. Um, yeah, can you can you tell us a little bit about your background and then tell us a little bit about the Jones Act, and then we'll we'll hear um, next from Ed Enos, who's our own harbor pilot that helps the ships come in well and has been on the show a few times about this topic, and then Jonathan from the Grassroots Institute. Sounds good. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. So my name is Colin Grabo. I am a research fellow at the Cato Institute here in Washington D.C. Uh, I focus on trade policy, and uh, one area that I pay a lot of attention to is the Jones Act. Uh, the Jones Act is Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, which basically says that to transport goods between two points in the United States by water, you have to use a vessel that is U.S. flagged. It is mostly U.S. crewed, mostly U.S. owned, and the vessel has to be built in the United States. Okay, and then uh, that causes a lot of extra charges on our shipping and it slows down sometimes the pathways. I want to bring in Ed Enos. We have done other shows before and we looked at what are good reasons for having the Jones Act. Um, in my role as county council person, I'm inclined towards wanting to amend it rather than to repeal it. But Ed, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you so much for coming on the air with us and um, your perspective on the Jones Act. Um, Ed, I'm not quite hearing you. Could you be possibly muted? How's that? Better. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I've jumped in here at the last minute um, with your last minute invitation, trying to get caught up on things. Um, First of all, I, I speak for myself. I'm not speaking for any companies that I don't work for. I'm not speaking for the pilots in general. Um, I'm expressing my own opinion, although a lot of people that I work with obviously support the Jones Act. So the reason I think the Jones Act is so vitally important to the people of Hawaii as an island state, thousands of miles from the United States or, or the nearest point of land is simply for economic security. You can look around right now if you're in my industry and you can see that foreign cargo carriers all over the Pacific are skipping ports as they determine on their own schedule to not pick up cargo or not deliver cargo that the cargo owners have arranged for on, on any given voyage. And that's something that most Americans are either unaware of and would never find out. But in this past year, we've seen the freight rates for uh, shipping anything in the world you know, skyrocket, and now they're collapsing. So ship owners go where they make the most money. They alter their schedules and the capacity that they have on any given voyage or route anywhere in the Pacific as it benefits them. So my concern as a local resident in an the only island state is that if we simply took away the Jones Act tomorrow, that foreign car cargo carriers will serve these islands in a way and in a schedule and in a capacity that benefits them financially, not so much what we need or want. That's my concern. Okay, thank you. And then I'm gonna bring in Jonathan, uh, do you want to introduce yourself from the Cato Institute? We actually have two people, Mark and Jonathan Hilton and then Mark Coleman from uh, the Grassroots Institute. Jonathan, can you introduce yourself and tell us your perspective? Because the Grassroots Institute is working to 
either repeal or amend uh, the Jones Act. And so I'd like to hear that argument. Yes, of course, Felicia. Thank you for having us on the show. Um, I'm, I'm a policy researcher here at Grassroot. I've been working on the Jones Act issue for a couple of years now. Um, and I think that I think that you said it correctly. We're working to either amend or repeal the Jones Act. And, you know, there's a lot of support um, in Congress for the Jones Act. There's a lot of people who want to keep it around. There, you know, there's people who are looking at reform. And I think I think the real value of having this conversation, you know, we've got a lot of different perspectives here. I think the real value is maybe there's a way forward that would amend the Jones Act to help the US maritime industry. Because overall, the US maritime industry, when it comes to the ocean going segment, isn't doing too well. Um, there were over 200 ships that were, you know, operating in the ocean going part of the industry back in 1980. Today, there's less than 100. So those are, mm -hmm. those are Jones Act ships, and their numbers have dwindled. The number of big U.S. shipyards that build those kind of ships, they've dwindled as well. So just having the Jones Act around as it is, it might provide some benefits, but the U.S. maritime industry is in decline. And I think it's very important we have conversations like this so that we can you know, try to figure out a way that would maybe work for both sides, help everyone. Thank so you, can sir. I make a comment about Jonathan's statement? I'm, you know, yes. I'm not trying to be argumentative, but what what he said is factually correct. However, here we go again. It you know it's not the fault of the general public or even the politicians who formulate national policy. The re, one of the contributing reasons that you have less ships in your comparison is uh, you know 100 to 200 over the span of maybe what 30 years is because the size of the ships and the amount of cargo that today's ships can carry relative to ships that were built and operating 30 years ago is considerably different. So you can, you can, you can make the statement correctly that there, you know, our U.S. flag fleet isn't as big as it was by the numbers X number of years ago. That's factually true. But you know, you can look at the Hawaii's market in and of itself. We're being served every day by the correct needed capacity from the West Coast to our islands. We don't need or want for any more ships than we have currently that are bringing in a relatively stable amount of cargo that is demanded in these islands. So I'm not arguing with Jonathan's point. It's correct. But again, the big picture is when you look at oil tankers years ago, cargo ships years ago, cruise ships years ago, the scale and size of these ships that are moving all these things is much different today than it was 30, 40 years ago. Okay, thank you for that. And then um, if I'm remembering correctly from an earlier show you and I did, Ed, I had learned that the type of fuel that's used in foreign ships Particularly, some have a, a, you know, a, they fly under, say, Mongolia or some place that is even a landlocked place. Um, sometimes they use dirty fuel that adds more um, uh, carbon and dirt to the atmosphere. We were learning about how it's actually hard because it puts all this um, black soot. In the Arctic, you know, it, it accelerates global warming was the argument for somebody that we had on there. We also had an argument that people are almost enslaved on some of these ships, even on American sailing vessels. Sometimes people have a very difficult time in these fishing boats and people end up missing, they die, they jump off the side, that in these larger ships from foreign vessels, especially under a flag that isn't really monitored, that there can be employment sector problems. I see, Mark, do you have your hand up? Oh, uh, no, no, I'm just, oh, okay. I'm just, okay. I'm just listening. Right. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, I actually would like to give Colin a chance to respond to what both Ed and I have brought up that we have heard as, or in Ed's case, this is his job. Mm. He's out there every day bringing in cargo ships. Hey, I'd like to add, well, I would like to say something, though. I'm the communication okay. director for the Grassroot Institute. It's it's grassroot, by the way, no S. Okay. After okay. Um, and um, I just want to, my understanding is that Ed is 
in general, a, a good friend of the Grassroot Institute. Um, we've talked with him from a lot through the years, not me really, but Joe Kent, our executive vice president, is good friends with him. And uh, on, on most things we, we agree, which is great news, um, but he does, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I see he raised his thumb there, that's good. Uh, we, we, we just differ on this one issue. And so that's nice that we're having this conversation in the open where we can uh, get his views out and, and like talk about it, um, you know, before an audience, it's really cool. And thanks Ed, oh. for being here. Sure, yeah. I, I wish I had known <laughs> earlier, I would have maybe thought more about what we're gonna talk about today, but. Um... Oh no, well, you know, it's a lot of it's off the cuff here. We, yeah. we all, we're all familiar with this material and um, yeah. I'm sure we can make some good progress for, for Felicia's yeah. uh, listeners. And you're right. Yes. I, I, you know, 99.9% .9 of everything they're doing, Kaylee's doing, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm on board with you guys all the way. And I just took Kaylee out and uh, Joe and Ted have been out to um, on our boat yeah. through the Harbor, showed them around, toured them around. And I just kind of gave them a little peek at things that otherwise I think they would never have an opportunity to do. And, you know, I try to do things like that. And, and actually um, Jonathan was with us on the last trip. So I think it's helpful. And again, my effort, really is more about trying to just present the idea to local people, you know, be careful what you wish for, because there may be unintended consequences from dramatically changing a policy, as opposed to other things you could be doing to benefit Hawaii residents that don't necessarily change the policy in and of itself. You know, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the concept of amending the Jones Act in and of itself, but I'm all for doing things for American ships, American shipping and the industry in general that improves things for them where we as residents out here in Hawaii benefit from. Yeah, and I think it, and I think Joe's probably expressed to you that our, our and as Jonathan hinted, our approach is really trying to be constructive to help the industry. We don't we see I think one misconception is that the Jones Act is the maritime industry. It's not. The maritime industry exists it would exist whether there was a Jones Act or not. Um, the Jones Act is our regulations on the industry. And if they were to go away, there still would be an industry. How it would look is you know, the question. And uh, we think it would look better. And even for, more, even for Americans, we think there'd be more shipping, more ships, more mariners, Americans, uh, depending on the reform that you implement. But I would like to let Colin address your couple of concerns uh, that you mentioned sure. uh, concerning the size of the ships supposedly making a difference and you know the alleged slave labor allegations uh, well the alleged slave labor things like that yes and and even the the fuels that are used so colin would you fuels. yeah well thank you very much uh, a bunch of things thrown out there uh, uh, i'd like to respond to um Let's see, Mark, you brought up um, the size of the fleet. Ed, you brought up the size of the fleet as well. Yes, you can measure the fleet by the number of ships. You can also measure the fleet by its dead weight tonnage, which is to say its cargo capacity, how much stuff it can transport. Well, since 1980, we've seen the number of ships go down from 257 to about, I think, 92 today. Uh, but guess what? It's also gone down uh, by half as measured by dead weight tonnage, the amount of stuff it can, uh, the fleet can carry. So measured either way, the fleet is in decline. Uh, that's not a huge, and it's even more, I think, of an indictment given that our economy is so much bigger uh, over the last 40 years, our population has grown, yet the Jones Act fleet is shrinking. This isn't a huge surprise when you consider the fact that Jones Act ships are so expensive and so uncompetitive. A US built ship costs about four to five times more than one built in another country. Matson just a month or two ago, placed a new order for three ships for a billion dollars. Those same ships overseas, uh, I think the uh, cargo capacity is around 3,600 TEUs on those ships. And those are more like $70 million ships, I think maximum overseas each. So, you know, who, who pays that? Uh, Ed brought up the fact that, you know, foreign shipping companies, they're profit maximizing. Uh, they don't, uh, I, I think, uh, say what's best for the consumer. They always want to do what's best for them. But guess what? That's also true of Jones Act shipping companies. They're no different. Matson, it's a publicly listed company. They're out there, profit maximized, and, and God bless them. I have nothing against that. But when you, when you think about the fact that they have ships that are very expensive to build, and they're about 
three times more expensive to operate than foreign uh, shipping companies, the inevitable result is high shipping rates. And then there's less competition on top of all of it. I mean, basically when it comes to uh, deep draft ocean going ships that go from the West Coast to Hawaii, you have, you have uh, Pesha and Madison to choose from, that's it. Internationally, you have many more shipping lines to choose from. So you have expensive ships, uh, there's expensive to build, expensive to operate, less competition. The inevitable result is going to be expensive shipping. And I've never heard of a situation where you get better service, lower costs through reduced competition, which is what the Jones Act does. Lastly, as far as you know, reliance on foreign shipping, let's keep in mind Hawaii is already reliant on foreign shipping. Ed's a harbor pilot. He knows that uh, the ships that come in, the tankers carrying a lot of the fuel, the bulk commodities that go to Hawaii, a lot of that is foreign. I think the majority of that is foreign. Um, so Hawaii is already reliant on foreign shipping. This is nothing new. And I think ultimately what we, those of us in the pro-reform uh, or repeal um, camp want to see is just more competition. We want to see Americans be able to choose uh, with the ships that they think are best for them. I think only good things happen when you have more competition out there. So Colin, I, I agree with generally a lot of the things that you said, you're, you're spot on. Okay. So I, and but, this is Ed Enos speaking. Yep. <laughs> okay. So, um, but here you go again, it, it's in, and in, in for the non-maritime public or people who don't do what we do every day. And I mean, you guys too, this is a complicated issue. And I'm going to try to walk through some of your things really simply, really simply. Why is it so cheap for China or South Korea to build a ship in their shipyards for a fraction of what we do, do here? Obviously, because their governments totally subsidize those industries. They completely subsidize their operating uh, costs, their ship owners, and the ship businesses. If we want to match ships built in America or ships operating dollar for dollar in China, all we have to do is completely subsidize those industries. Am I correct? It, it's it's it's, it's yeah, no no. Actually, I would take I would take issue with that. Ed, if okay, I well, let me, let me finish. Let me talk so you can have let me have my turn. Okay, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. It, it is it is a fact that nobody can argue that their their shipbuilding industry is entirely subsidized to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars a year, and their ship operators. That's why the cost to build there is so cheap. During COVID, in the last couple of years, a lot of their shipyards were shutting down because they could not sustain themselves. They were going out of business, just like everybody else around the world. And so the Chinese Communist Party had to go in and handpick which yards they wanted to survive and just bulldoze money at them to stay active. Similarly, in South Korea, a completely different kind of country and government, they suffer the same fate. And so their government too recognizes that the ship building and the ship operating industries in their country are the kinds of industries that they want to maintain. So their governments also go in there and they just shovel money at these guys to sustain them. That's, that's the problem that we face. And not only we here in America, but Europe does too. You know, so we we do, in fact, give some American ship operators some amount of money, like in the Maritime Security Program. It's pennies on the dollar compared to what everybody else is doing. But that's not just uniquely an American problem, okay? Europeans can't, can't compete against the Chinese as well. Some ship operators are trying to figure out a way for a company like Carnival to go build these huge luxury cruise ships over in China because they can do that at a fraction of the cost that they're building them in Europe. But hey, guess what? They've tried that, failed, can't do it. It's a quality issue, they can't do it. So the Europe Europeans continue to build their cruise ships in Europe. But that's one of the problems with why you, you keep complaining about and comparing our ship's cost to their ship's cost. If you wanna solve that problem, you can, you can leave the Jones Act as is, but do it through some other subsidy issue or tax or some other some other way of doing it. As far as competition is concerned, here in the state of Hawaii, there's only so many boxes you're going to carry from the West Coast to Hawaii. I don't care if you've got 10 ships on that route or 20 ships on that route. 
or 100 ships on that route. There's only so much cargo that can be moved from LA to Honolulu. Now, if you think competition, which in general works in concept, but the reality is, if you're bringing in, let's just say 5,000 boxes a week from LA to Honolulu, and there's two carriers doing that, they're gonna charge X number of dollars per box to do that. You bring in a third or fourth or even a fifth carrier, there's still 5,000 boxes. And, and maybe initially like Hawaiian and Aloha did, you're gonna start lowering the freight rates, but at some point in time, some carrier is gonna go, I can't carry fewer boxes at a lower rate and stay in business, I'm out. So he leaves just like we saw in the aviation industry here. And ultimately, every carrier keeps operating at a point, at a loss, like we've seen, until the, until the smaller guy goes out because there's only still so much cargo to carry week to week on average. And now you're back with only one or two carriers. That, that's we do, have, we do have more than just one air carrier now. You know, It's not just Hawaiian. Southwest is in the market. Alaska Air was in there for a while. There are other airlines that carry passengers in Island. Aloha, Aloha Air was, you know, a lot of people said it was poorly managed. Um, I, I, I wish people would stop bringing that example up as a, as a you know, as a, I wish they'd stop bringing Aloha up as an example. Um, in terms of competition, the, the, you're looking at the market in a very static way, is my opinion. Um, maybe there'll be more boxes. Maybe there'll be less. Maybe there'll be fewer. I mean. Um, we, 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 nothing is, you know, the way, nothing is static in the market, uh, depending and, on and the freight rates, maybe we'll have, we'll have more competition and more, and more, more shipping. And you're hearing from Mark Coleman of the Grassroots Institute. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, there was a lot to chew on there. What you said, uh, Ed, um, the American shipping industry, in fact, Matson, I think if I'm not mistaken, you know, they get about $10 million a year or more for subsidies for their, in, in, under their, one of those government programs to improve their vessels. Um, so there is some subsidi subsidization of the US um, shipping industry going on, even by American. But you're right, actually, that's, you know, as Colin has said many times, if maybe the Jones Act is not the best way to achieve what you're trying to achieve. Uh, right now, the costs are, are being borne most heavily by people like people in Hawaii and Alaska and Puerto Rico when maybe it should be more fairly distributed through some general funding program. And that's something maybe uh, Jonathan or, 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 or Colin would like to talk about in addition to the China thing that you brought up. Yeah, I'll jump in here just real quickly. I wanna mention okay, one thing. Okay, Jonathan, about, thank you. Yes. Jonathan of the Grassroot Institute. There's one thing, when it comes to the price of building a ship, I, I think, you know, I think Ed is correct that subsidies from foreign governments do play a, a, a part in why um, those ships are cheaper. The one other big thing, though, is economy of scale. If a shipyard um, in Japan, South Korea, China can build 60 ships of the same model, they're going to get good at building that kind of ship. In the United States, you know, there's three, maybe four large shipyards that build um, privately owned ships. And if they only build two ships of the same model, you know, it, 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 it takes a learning curve to be able to build um, that ship and then build it at a cost effective manner. So I think that I think in addition to subsidies, you do have an economy of scale problem that allows Japan, China, South Korea, even if they didn't have the subsidies, if they had that economy of scale, they'd be better positioned in the United States. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and, and you know, that's exactly true. But here you go again. It's a very complicated issue. When you talk about building ships, like we see for Matson or Pace or Horizon Lines, when you talk about building ships specifically in the Jones Act trade, right now, both Matson and Pace have just launched several hulls that for the next 30 to 40 years, even just say, say the next 10 or 20 years, they're going to be running. They won't need a bunch more ships. So when you talk about how do we make the American shipbuilding industry more competitive? You have to look beyond just the Jones Act trade because that's a defined, restricted market of hulls that are only, only so many are needed in so many routes that, that feed the Jones Act trade. You're, you're kind of conflating building ships for global trade and global voyaging and all that. 
And I'm all for that. And I don't know anybody in this industry who's not for that. I, I agree with you. You're right. The only way we're ever going to have shipyards that build large vessels that can compete against, you know, China, South Korea, Japan, Europe, whatever, is to incentivize private investors and owners to go out there and build ships that run and operate and are owned by U.S. interests. And, you know, here you go again. You're not trying to change the Jones Act as a national policy. You're trying to incentivize private business people and investors through tax policy or some other means that brings them in to want to have an American home, to want to carry cargo overseas to foreign countries on an American ship. You know, again, that that's where it gets confusing when you talk about international trade over international routes, and then you focus on the Jones Act, which is a very restricted trade. So that's why, you know, it, it's easy to say, well, we want more competition. Well, okay, it, in concept, that's good. But you have to look at the con unintended consequences of that. Well, Ed, uh, other Mark Coleman again here. Um, um, what would I would like to jump in for a moment and say you are listening to KKCR Hanalei, KAQA Kilauea with Felicia and Alana Kawai Soapbox. And we are listening to a discussion on the Jones Act with Mark Coleman and Jonathan Helton of the Grassroot Institute, Ed Enos, who is a harbor pilot for the state of Hawaii. That is somebody who helps move all these ships around safely as they come into port. So he has direct experience with that. And then also Colin Grabo from the Cato Institute. And we are going to hear really briefly um, how you can support KKCR because that's how we have excellent discussions like this for an hour on the radio with Oahu, Ni'ihau and um, Kauai. And by the way, we are streaming worldwide on kkcr.org, as well as this show is being recorded and will be on um, YouTube. So um, thank you for supporting KKCR. Underwriting support strengthens our community and builds your business. Underwriting messages on KKCR reach more listeners than any other Kauai radio station. Call 826-7774 or visit kkcr.org and click on underwrite. All right, and mahalo for supporting Kauai Community Radio. Um, I want to address a couple of issues that you guys might be able to answer well. Um, one is that since sugar isn't operating effectively any longer, and even our um, seed corn has really reduced in size, I want to talk about uh, product leaving Hawaii. It seems like ships leave relatively empty. Perhaps, Ed, you can correct me on that, but I just wonder about that market when there's not the money going in both directions. And then I'm wanting to guide your guys' discussion where if where we can see a solution, you know, it might not be as we're starting to talk about directly in the Jones Act, or if there were amendments, how that would would be done. But you know, so like in the second half hour, um, we can talk about what's wrong, but I'd also like to make sure at least in the last 15 minutes, which is 15 minutes from now, that we talk about, um, you know, just a little bit more of what we can do and basically how it impacts all of our, our people who live here or even who visit here is high shipping rates and even the inner island amounts went up substantially this year. So um, thank you on that. And um, I guess, Mark, you had the floor for the moment, so. Well, I'd really like to hear more from Colin and uh, about okay. some of the earlier points, but let me just throw it out that um, one thing that Jones Act, one thing the US shipyards, well, two things US shipyards do not build right now are cruise ships. There hasn't been a U.S. cruise ship built in America since like 50, 60 years ago. Um, and they never and they're just not capable of doing it. Um, so that's off the table. And they also don't build LNG carriers. And that's one reason why Jones Act waivers are being begged. Liquid, nat by liquid natural natural Li gas. Liquid natural gas. Um, that's when that's why Puerto Rico was getting it from Russia. 
Um, New England want, was getting it from Russia and, and wants, wants to get more of it from foreign sources because it's too expensive to ship. You can't, you can't ship LNG from the West Coast, from the, the Gulf you know, of Mexico, uh, Texas, Louisiana, up to New England. It costs too much um, on a Jones Act ship. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway. Well, well I, okay. Would you so favor waivers problem, for that? Would you favor there, waivers for that? A lot. That's brought up a lot by a lot of, you know, a lot of anti Jones Act guys, but John McCowan, and I would encourage all your listeners and viewers to go look at this guy up on the online, John McCowan. Yeah, he's know. writing a long paper on this mm -hmm. and he's detailed the, the facts, the facts of this. And the reason they don't choose to, to bring in LNG from the U.S. Gulf Coast is they're bringing it in from somewhere else that's closer and cheaper. So, right. you know, it, it's again, it's like all over the world. You know, I take ships in the anchor, but it's cheaper Honolulu because of the shipping rates. Oil right. from the Middle East, you know. So, you, you, you're talking about the energy trade. None of it makes any sense to, to anybody just looking at it. Stuff moves all around the world depending on whatever the price is, the buyer and the seller agree to wherever it's coming from and how it's getting shipped. We can't do that in Hawaii. Uh, well, we do it in Hawaii. We do it all uh, the time. Except for the Jones Act, because we can't go to anybody but Matson. Or... Okay, so here we go again. The Jones Act has nothing to do. Uh, okay, repeat after me. The Jones Act has nothing to do with importing oil from foreign countries. The Jones Act has nothing to do. Oh, but that's why we get it mostly from foreign, from foreign countries. Mark, Mark, let him finish. So, um, and then we're going to go to Colin. I just want to let him finish because so it's easier uh, on the I, listener. I, I, yeah. Okay. Well, go ahead, Colin. I think you need to. Okay. In. Well, so a lot of things, a uh, lot, lot of disagreement here, but I did identify one area of agreement. Um, uh, Ed Enos accurately said, that, you know, the Jones Act. It's it's a small market. It's a small market, you know, it's a, it's a fraction of what the international market is. What this means is that when shipyards build for the Jones Act market, they'll build two ships at a time. Maybe, maybe they'll get four ships, but like, you know, Pasha, they're, they're Pasha, sorry, their most recent order was for two container ships. You know, internationally, people order a dozen ships. The economies of scale are just completely out of whack. So high costs, you know, take subsidies off the table. If the subsidies were eliminated tomorrow, U.S. ships ships would still cost much more than foreign ships because we have these small economies of scale. Um, this helps explain why actually back in the 1990s, the Clinton administration, they negotiated an international deal to rein in uh, shipbuilding subsidies. They had Korea sign on, they had Japan sign on, they had European sign on. US shipyards vetoed that deal. They know that in a subsidy free world, they still lose. They're technologically inferior. US shipbuilding, a lack of competitiveness. This dates back to the 1800s. You can go back to like the 1880s and find U.S. ships were 20, 40 percent more expensive to build. This is nothing new. This isn't something that just happened when China came along. Um, furthermore, I think we also need to ask the questions. If our allies in South Korea and Japan want to subsidize their shipyards and make their ships really, really cheap for Americans to buy, then why not let our shipping companies buy from them? Um, Can I jump in on that one? Yes. Can I jump yes. in on that one? Go. Um, that one means. that one makes me a little uncomfortable. What I look at has happened since the 1970s when we became the world reserve currency. We've basically lost our whole manufacturing. A lot of it's gone to China, but it went to Mexico, went to all these other countries because at a currency level, we were able to really call the shots. We 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 had like an endless credit card relative to these other countries. So then we no longer are even manufacturing our own things. So when I hear that, that makes me a little nervous because um, if America doesn't know how to make any of our own ships, maybe we won't be able to make any of our own ships. Maybe our regular ships will become like those cruise ships. And so we will be vulnerable to um, not having a major infrastructure, important infrastructure for ourselves to have. So that's a thought that comes to me. Well, I appreciate that. Let me address that, though. That's a good question. It's a good point. Uh, two things. Number one, in terms of just manufacturing overall, the U.S. is actually we're one of the world's top manufacturers. It's just that we use fewer people to do it. Uh, fewer people go work in factories because we've automated so much. Um, and a lot of stuff you buy uh, that we manufacture is not stuff you get uh, down at the local store. It's, you know, Boeing airplanes, things like that uh, that you may not, you know, that we don't make consumer goods, but we do make a lot of stuff. 
But then in terms of, of ship building, you know, this is a, a legitimate concern. What if we don't know how to build ships? What if we're reliant on foreigners for our ship building needs? Guess what? That's the status quo. These Jones Act ships, let's take the last Jones Act ship that was delivered for Pesha. Uh, it was built by a shipyard in Texas. The shipyard is owned by a Singaporean firm. It was foreign designed. The components that go into it, they're you know, largely foreign, including from China. Um, in fact, the Philly shipyard, which has built something like half of all Jones Act ships in the last 20 years, I remember they had one tanker they were building. For each tanker, they had 500 containers of stuff brought over from South Korea and another 25 shipments of bulk items like the propeller. Basically, these U.S. shipyards are kind of like, you know, it's like buying something from Ikea. Yes, I buy the kit and I assemble it. Did I really make it? I mean, you know, U.S. shipyards are buying designs from foreigners. They're buying all the components from foreigners, and they just are assembling them together. So we're hugely reliant on foreigners. In fact, the last thing I'll, I'll bring up, since we talked about LNG earlier, you know, you may ask the question, well, why don't we just build an LNG tanker in the United States? In fact, there was a government report a few years ago that looked into this. What would it take to build those kinds of ships in the U.S.? They identified two shipyards in the U.S. they thought could do it. And one of the shipyards said, look, to do something like that, we'd probably have to bring over like 300 South Koreans to oversee the work and make sure it was done properly and teach us how to do it. So reliance on foreigners, that's where we're at with the Jones Act in place. The Jones Act doesn't mean we're not reliant on foreigners. It just means we pay outrageous prices for new ships. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out, I mean, what Ed. you just described is true for a lot of manufacturing throughout the United States and a lot of different sectors of our economy. Uh, no one's sure. going to deny that. But, you know, my question to you is, why would what little we have, why do you think throwing all the rest of it at China is going to be a, a positive outcome for America? I just can't figure that out at all. I would like to come up with policies, like I said, you know, some kind of incentivization program that brings stuff to America to reduce those costs, to bring that innovation, to bring those designs and manufacturing to this country so that Americans are rewarded. Why do we want to take what little we have left and not, not just throw it away, but just bulldoze it away over to a foreign country? Didn't you learn anything at all the last three years about China? Why would you want to help them out anymore? I mean, haven't we learned it all from that experience? I say, I say, some of the things that you're saying, Colin, is generally true in concept, but I, you know, I stand over here in Hawaii where you know, the in, unintended consequences of what you say on the mainland, it's not gonna have any problem with you, but the people here in Hawaii, we're gonna be the direct, we're gonna see the direct impact of any changes in national policy, it's gonna impact us. So I'm all for changing rules, amending things, whatever, such that it benefits America and local Hawaii residents. And let's just, let's, like she was, Felicia was saying a moment ago, let's think of one thing. What's the most single biggest cost to a ship owner and a ship operator today, anywhere in the world, any flag, any owner? Fuel, right? So if that's a single biggest cost, because the crew cost, all those other issues, Ship owner to ship owner, country to country, flag to flag. In general, the annual budget to run a ship, those costs are pretty minuscule. The single biggest expense any ship owner anywhere has to deal with is fuel. Well, lo and behold, Joe Biden is over there throwing all our strategic oil preserves off to China and to foreign countries. That's our oil. That's supposed to be serving the American interest. What is he doing that for? Why don't we develop a plan where American Jones Act ship operators and ship owners are either having their fuel subsidized or we're pulling that from some other program, such as, as you guys say, the people in Puerto Rico and Alaska and Hawaii aren't having to pay for that as a national policy. To me, that's the single biggest thing you could do tomorrow. But nobody's thought of stuff like that. I can't figure that out. Well, well, if I may, if, if we want to reduce the this cost of energy- This is Colin from the, if, the Cato Institute. If we want to encourage Americans to buy more American energy, that's they do get rid of the Jones Act. I we discovered that when we, when we, well, let me finish, let me finish, let me finish. When we, when we imposed that. sanctions on Russia, we discovered that we had 
refineries in the mid-Atlantic that were importing Russian oil, the same grades that are produced here in the United States. We had the president of OSG, the Overseas Shipping Group, which is a Jones at Carrot. He admitted in a 2017 uh, Financial Times article, he said, yes, we would buy, there would be more shipping of American oil within the United States if we didn't have the Jones Act, because Jones Act shipping is more expensive. So we have this ridiculous situation in the United States where we export a lot of our oil, and then we import a lot of our oil, because once you factor in the cost of shipping, it doesn't make sense to buy American energy. And this is what the Jones Act does. It's a disincentive to buying American products because we make it too expensive to buy. We disincentivize it financially, or in the case of LNG, we make it impossible because there are no Jones Act ships. And to bring it to the Hawaii, as you know, uh, Ed, a liquefied petroleum gas, LPG, we are the world's largest exporter. We have no Jones Act ships to transport it. So Hawaii has no choice but to buy that from abroad. The most pro-American thing we could do is get rid of this law, which has failed by every metric in terms of size of the fleet, number of mariners, ships produced. By any reasonable metric, the law is not working. It's absolutely failed. We need to scrap it and start new with our revisit our maritime policy. Good job. Can I jump in real quick? I was going to actually follow back around. This is Jonathan. Hey, Jonathan. Yes. Yes. Just follow back around to something you said at the break, Felicia. You know, we want to talk about... Going back to seed corn, sugar, right? Ships that come to Hawaii, the container ships, and then go back to the mainland. Usually when they're going back from Hawaii, those those containers are um, a lot more empty than when they were when they came to Hawaii from the West Coast. So any anything that a business in Hawaii is sending back to California, sending back to Washington, the rates for going back to the mainland are a lot lower than the rates for when you're bringing something from the mainland to Hawaii. So th that backhaul rate is a little bit lower. Um, but when it comes to agriculture, any time you're going to ship an input, maybe fertilizer from the US mainland to Hawaii, the fertilizer is going to be more expensive if it's carried on a Jones Act ship. You know, I think, you know, I think everyone here, regardless of whether, you know, pro Jones Act, pro reform, pro repeal, whatever, the Jones Act does impose an additional shipping rate as to as, as compared to a foreign vessel. So your fertilizer that you're bringing in from the mainland is, is going to be somewhat more expensive. Um, since And so anytime you're talking about an agriculture industry, the input cost is going to be higher because of the Jones Act. Um, but last thing, one more thing, Ed, if I can. When we're talking about, you know, okay, how do what's a reform that we could make that, you know, might make maybe not everyone happy, but that would be an improvement on the status quo. I think a really good example is agriculture in Hawaii. There, you know, there's a story that one time a rancher in Hawaii put some cows on a Boeing 737, flew them to the U.S. mainland. You know, that maybe happened once. I'm not saying it's a common occurrence, but there are no U.S. cattle carriers in the fleet. So maybe, maybe one reform could be if there aren't any Jones Act vessels of a certain kind in the fleet, we make a policy that says that kind of ship can have a waiver. So maybe Hawaii's ranchers, they're going to send cows to the U.S. mainland. Maybe they can get an automatic waiver from the Jones Act since, since there's simply no ships that are, there's no cattle carrying ships in the Jones Act fleet. Same for the LNG, same for the yeah. PVSA, the Passenger Vessel Services Act, cruise ships. Um, and yeah, that's what I was going to say earlier. That's a great. Well, okay, to so me, that's an easy. Let me chime in here on some. Let me chime in here on some factual realities. Okay. This is Ed Enos, the harbor pilot. I, I worked here in Hawaii as a pilot on board some of the cattle carriers that call it Kauai High for years. Uh, you know, I, I I've seen that trade. I know what it's like. I know what those ships are like. And if any of the ranters on the Big Island want to go grab a real cheap supply boat that's laid up in the Gulf Coast right now, there's hundreds of them. If they wanted to, they could go get one for a song, bring it out here. They can convert that thing over, which is pretty much what I was driving in on a Kauai High Harbor. Okay, they're not real big, elaborate, luxury, you know, complicated ships. Why do they don't do that? Because they don't want to do that. It's a choice they make, okay? They could do this on their own if they wanted to, but they don't want to invest their own money to control you know, their own livestock going back. And believe me, in the, in the trade between the West Coast and Hawaii, there are horses, pigs, cattle, sheep. There's a ton of livestock going back and forth. Nobody ever even knows that, okay? 
if the livestock guys on, on the Big Island and Maui and Oahu wanted to do that on their own, on a U.S. flagship, they could. But they don't want to do that. Why? Because it's so much easier to throw their livestock in a trailer, put it on the back of a Matson ship, and set it up there. And that happens every week all the time, year-round. And it has been for years. Okay? Number two. We try to get LNG, I attended a lot of meetings with the heck on all those guys and Harbors and I, we try to get LNG brought into Hawaii, even if you had a ship tomorrow, there's no interest in that. There's a lot of challenges and problems associated with bringing LNG to Hawaii and doing the whole distribution thing. It's complicated and it's very, but it's not for the lack of trying or desire even, you know, and um with regard to the cruise ships, that's another out of context statement you guys always make. The cruise ship industry here in Hawaii is a thriving, profitable business. I know because I go on those ships all the time, year round. Man, I just worked two weeks off duty because we had so darn many cruise ships going in our island, you know, that I had to go out of my off time to go work on these ships going between the islands. You can you could say the Passenger Services Act, which is the cruise ship version of the Jones Act, you can say that that's a problem. The reality is it is not. It never has been. It isn't today. And it's not going to be in, in the future. You can look out your window if you live in downtown Honolulu. You can go down to Nuwili Willy Harbor if you live there in Kauai. And you can see foreign cruise ships in there all the time, changing the Jones Act or the Passenger Service Vessels Act but that's not going to change what they do at all. Oh, sure. Maybe they'll skip going to Ensenada for a couple hours. But other than that, the people in Hawaii are not going to see any material substantive change by changing the Passenger Services Act. And for the cargo ships, to, to the Kauai residents, let me paint this picture for you so you have a better understanding what we're talking about. Imagine getting on a plane in Kauai and flying to L.A., to go visit family and friends. Everybody gets off that plane, the plane closes its doors and it flies back to Kauai empty. That's what Matson and Patient are doing every day. Now you tell me, how is Hawaiian Airlines ever gonna make money doing a deadhead run several times a day back to Kauai, not carrying any passengers or having any revenue? How do they make that up? They make that up by having to charge more <coughs> On the revenue carrying leg, which is bringing everything down here, the aviation industry has the luxury of being full every time a plane goes back and forth to the West Coast. That's not the case in the Jones Act trade. You know, you go down to Honolulu Harbor, you see a ship full of containers. And it's leaving, going out of the harbor, and it turns left. It goes to the West Coast. Every single container on that ship is empty. You still got to pay for fuel. You still got to pay for maintenance, repair, insurance, crew. All those costs are still there. But there's no money made on half the time that ship's running back and forth. How does any company, whether it's foreign or American, how does any company want to come back in this trade? I mean, you can find a guy who wants to come in this trade. Let me know. But all the foreign carriers, all the, quote, competitors that you see out there that are running across the Pacific Ocean from China to L.A., their ships are 10 times the size of a matching ship. Not only, even if they wanted to, they could even come here. But nobody wants to. There's no reason for a ship to divert from their trans-Pacific route from, say, China or Japan over to L.A., Oakland, or Seattle or San Francisco. That's way out of their way. It, it, it looks... It might look pretty cool and groovy and easy on paper, but from a navigational standpoint, for these cargo carriers to run from Asia to the West Coast, they are so far away from Hawaii, it's not even funny. There is no incentive whatsoever to come here for, for a foreign carrier. So I have a question, Ed. If I am hearing you correctly, you're saying if we didn't have the Jones Act, there probably still would not be enough motivation for, say, a Chinese ship to just go a little south, stop by Hawaii, and then carry on to uh, the west coast of the United States. I'll make it even easier for you. If you got rid of the Jones Act tomorrow and, and anything associated with that law or rule, what, what would it materially change in terms of, because this is, this is the bottom line for everybody's discussion, right? 
How is that materially going to change the price of, of a loaf of bread, jar of mayonnaise, a six pack of beer? I, I don't know. I, I mean, honestly, you know, there's been quote studies done. Yeah, studies on both sides. Everybody's arguing this issue. Okay. But if you put China Ocean Shipping Company carrying all the cargo that's needed by Hawaii residents between LA and Honolulu Harbor, what do you think their freight rates are going to be? If they had no competition, they're going to charge whatever the market will bear, just like they do everywhere else all over the world. You can, you can, you know, you can have 20 companies trying to break into this market. Ultimately, a subsidized ship owner like Costco, China Ocean Shipping Company, will lowball everybody until they kill off all their competition because they can. And as soon as the last guy leaves, what are they going to do? Jack their rates up. And how do I know that that's true? <laughs> because that's what's been happening here in the Pacific trade the last two years. Go look at it online. Ship owners have been making, they've made more money last year than they ever have. Why? Because they could. Guess what? The market has turned around a 180 upside down on its head. The freight rates are collapsing in every trade. And so now they're begging for cargo from different companies like Home Depot, Costco, Lowe's and all that. You know, four or five months ago, it was like, hey, we don't care what you like. We're going to charge whatever you want. It's completely different now. That is the foreign cargo market that you guys keep talking about in comparison to the Jones Act trade, which is apples and orange. It's got nothing to do with the other. And it's an unfair contrast to compare those two things in the maritime shipping industry to the general public who doesn't know any better. So thank you for that um, strong final word, Ed Enos, Harbor Pilot in Hawaii. I want to let, before we finish the show, each of the others have a final word. Um, I think you've made uh, very strong arguments, Ed, and I, you know, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to move to Colin, uh, some final thoughts, and then we'll go to Jonathan and then Mark. And if there's some major thing, then you can make another comment, but I want to let everybody have a, have a statement. I know it's one person in one position and three others, but, but um, Colin. Well, Felicia, uh, just I'd like to once again thank you for having uh, me on the program. I think it's been a great discussion, a uh, great opportunity to hear from different uh, perspectives. Uh, you know, I would just conclude by saying I think that the Jones Act is a it's a failure. Um, it's not working. It's not working for Hawaii. It's not working for the United States. It's not even working for the U.S. maritime industry, uh, given its performance. It's it's not providing in terms of ships, in terms of mariners, in terms of shipbuilding. Again, by I think any reasonable metric, it's not working. But what it is doing is raising costs. Uh, Jones Act ships are very expensive to build, expensive to operate. That means higher shipping rates and you know higher transportation factors into everything. It, it's so fundamental to our economy, and especially um, uh, an island like Hawaii, an island state like Hawaii that's so dependent on ocean shipping. Um, so I, I, I think that it's high time for some kind of changes to be made to this law. Uh, at the very least, we should allow Americans to buy uh, foreign built ships. And that's nothing radical. This is what we do for every other form of transportation. You can use foreign built trucks, foreign built airplanes in the United States, uh, foreign built rail uh, rolling stock. Um, so let's just bring the Jones Act at a minimum. Let's just bring it in line with all of our other laws and make it like all of our other laws. And um, I, I think it would do a lot of good for the U.S. maritime industry and uh, Hawaii consumers and residents. Thank you so much. And Jonathan, um, kind of giving you a little bit of a fresh question on this closing moment. Are there any uh, initiatives that are coming before our U.S. Congress? Because this would be a U.S. legislation. Is there any that are being considered um, that that causes the Grassroot Institute to be pushing on this? There's a, there's a couple of bills in Congress right now. Um, U.S. Senator Mike Lee has a couple of bills that would reform the Jones Act and other related laws. And then Hawaii's own Ed Case also has some law has some proposed bills that would change the Jones Act. Yes, and if I can. Um, Related to the issue of, you know, is there a reform that can make everyone happy? Um, 
I just want to say a couple of things that I think we all agree on. We all agree that the U.S. maritime industry, the, the part of it that sails in the oceans at least, it's not doing too well right now. So whether you support the Jones Act, whether you oppose the Jones Act, something probably should be done. And so I think using that as a starting out point, you know, I think, you know, Ed is very knowledgeable about the industry. I know Colin's done a lot of research on this. Having conversations like this is how you fix it. Because right now, Congress is not fixing it. And if, you know, if, if this state continues, the U.S. maritime industry is not going to get better on its own. So I think that we have to continue having these conversations so that the U.S. maritime industry, hopefully, hopefully something gets better. And, you know, along with that, hopefully Congress in that conversation makes reforms that makes it cheaper to send goods to Hawaii. Thank you so much. And I know one of the things that I have heard is if this the burden of the cost was shared across the 50 states that that, you know, that would be something that maybe could be considered. I appreciate that you're all here. Mark Coleman is the one who inspired this show. So I'm giving you the final word. Wow, well, thank you very much. Um, and I'm really glad we could all be here. I'm really happy Ed showed up. Uh, late, call, late, late, late minute call there for you, Ed, but thanks for being here. Um, Colin, um, Jonathan, you know, I, I think our main point is that something has to be done. Uh, the the industry is in free fall. Uh, I think the industry ought to do something constructive uh, at its own initiative before it loses all it loses all its bargaining position. Um, and I think the 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 building uh, requirement, the U.S. build requirement, is one would be one easy fix that, with uh, some tweaks in the tax code, could prove beneficial for the U.S. shipbuilding industry and customers such as. Matson and Pesha. Another one would be to offer waivers uh, when there are no U.S. Jones Act ships available to ship certain products, whether that's LNG or Cowtainers or um, you know whatever. Um, and in general, um, I, I, perhaps I could close by just recommending your listeners go to the Grassroots Institute website. Uh, Jonathan, Oth Jonathan, and I, and Joshua, Josh, our uh, marketing director, Josh Mason. They they put together a, a booklet that we that filled with really great cartoons by Dave Swan uh, called Five Myths About the Jones Act um, that tackles issues some of the things that Ed brought up uh, including for example China supposedly being such a big enemy but you know all our ships from in the Jones Act fleet are repaired in China and maintained in China so there's something going on about that. Um, and, and just generally visit our website. We have a whole section, a slew of articles and studies uh, related to this really important issue, um, which is gaining steam. Um, I saw, well, yeah, so I'll close on that. Please visit our website. And, and the more you learn, the more likely you're going to be against the Jones Act. That's kind of what we feel. So Grassroots Institute, Grassroot, singular, institute.org yes. .org or .com? Dot uh, org. Thank you. Dot yes. org. Okay. Yes. And Ed, do you want to direct anybody to a website? Uh, no, but I would say, again, go look up John McCowan. He's on LinkedIn. Uh, I believe he's got a sub stack, but he, he has a lot of well-researched uh, articles uh, and his background. He's uh, from the maritime ministry on the operation side, he's very well versed, you know, probably the single smartest guy in this issue in the country today from based on, again, on his firsthand ship operating experience. And I, and I mean, the dollars and cents of all these issues. So, so that would be uh, John J O H N as opposed to J O N J O H N correct. and then yeah. M C C O W A N. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I uh, really appreciate all four of you for having this robust conversation with Kauai, Ni'ihau, and Oahu, and whoever else might want to watch this recording or um, be looking at it on kkcr.org. And this is also archived on our site. So thank you very much. And uh, I want to give Ed an extra special mahalo because I know today is an important day for you personally. and. Yeah. You came on with um, just a, a last moment little tug on the shoulder from me. So I did appreciate you say what the Did you say what the important day was, that it was his wife's birthday? 
I it's didn't my say wife's that. birthday and I got to run because we're going to dinner now. So okay, what's her I'm name? Sorry. What's her name? So I can tell her happy uh, birthday. Ginny. Happy birthday, Ginny. Yeah. KKCR and uh, the Hawaii public appreciate your time in helping us have a robust discussion because my experience, especially as a policymaker, is nothing is simple. Everything has unintended consequences, including not adapting to needed change. So we we need to be flexible, we need to be dynamic, and these type of conversations is how um, we begin to shift in whatever way is the best way, but I appreciate all of your knowledge and mana'o, even calling in late your time, Colin from Washington, D.C. So as we say here, mahalo nui, and I will, I will sign off with you guys. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. All you guys. Thank Mahalo. you very much. Yep. All, All right. right. Thank you guys. Aloha.